Hi. Hi. Wow, it's loud. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to all you beautiful Bible-toting ladies. My name is Vanita Jones, and I am part of the teaching team here at Women in the Word. And I can guarantee you, if the sun's not shining outside today, it's in here today. That is bright. Bright, you women are lit up out there like never before. You know, on my way here this morning, I prayed for each one of you, and I prayed that God's word would be rooted in your heart, and that as you studied and you read his word, that it would be something that permeated all of your life, so that ultimately you're going to lead a life that glorifies God in everything you do. See, that's what we're here on earth for. You know, people in America and all over the world, they spend billions of dollars trying to figure out what their identity is and what their purpose is. They buy books, they go to seminars, they go to conferences, they, they listen to things on television. But see, it's right here. It's been right here under our noses all the time, what our purpose is, and that's to bring glory to our God. Now, that may look different for each of you in what situation or where you are in life, but fundamentally, it doesn't change. We're to live a life that brings glory to God, no matter where you are and what circumstances you're in. Paul knew this truth. He not only knew it, I think he lived it. See, no matter the situation he found himself in, after he was saved on that dusty road to Damascus, he began to live a life that brought glory to God's great name. And if you remember, his life after he was saved was not a cakewalk. Remember, he was shipwrecked. We read this back in Acts when we studied Acts. He was shipwrecked. He was imprisoned much, much of the time. And if he wasn't imprisoned, he was running out of the town in fear for his life. I think the thing he probably did least was actually snuggle up in a nice warm bed and peacefully at night. But in everything he did in his Christian life, he knew that his purpose here on earth was to bring glory to his great God. Look what he wrote to the believers in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 on your verse sheet. Paul says this, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Do you notice he didn't say glorify God with your words? He said, glorify God with your body. It's more than just your words. See, as Christians, we can't just talk the talk. We have to walk the walk. What we say and what we do has to match up with what we say. Paul Mary very, Mary, Mary very, very well may have, excuse me for a minute, have learned this back when he studied the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. Remember, he was a Jewish leader and he would have known the scriptures. Back in Exodus 9, 16, God is sending Moses to deliver a message to the church, uh, to, I'm sorry, to uh, God's people and to Pharaoh who's in Egypt. And remember, Pharaoh had the Israelites enslaved in Egypt, and Moses is supposed to go before God sends a seventh plague, and he's supposed to tell Pharaoh this from God. He says, but for this purpose, I, God, have raised you, Pharaoh, up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Even Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the one that oppressed God's people so badly in Egypt, God had a purpose for his leadership. And God was gonna use his leadership to bring, ultimately bring glory to his great name. Now in 1 Peter 3, Paul is addressing the conduct of the church and the leadership of the church. And he ends the chapter three by addressing the mystery of godliness. And that applies to all of us, not just the leaders. Whether we're leaders in the church, outside the church, it applies to all of us. Now, I'm willing to bet that a few of you, or maybe a lot of you, as you first started to study this week, you opened up 1 Timothy 3 and you went, really, what does that have to do with me? It's talking about qualifications of an elder, qualifications of a deacon. You know, well, that's not gonna happen in my life. And I'll bet you, because I know I've done it myself, when I was doing one of those read through the Bibles in a, in a year, you got to 1 Timothy 3 and you kind of went, ooh, 1 Timothy 4. And you just kept on going because really there's not a lot in there that you thought you needed to know. You wanted something a little more relevant, but guess what? See, in 1 Timothy 3, we learn that all the church leaders, all church leaders have effect on Christians, all of us inside the church and outside the church. It's so important for us to study it. 
Some Christians have been greatly encouraged by church leaders. Others, let's be honest, they've been deeply hurt. They've been discouraged by poor leadership. Some of them may have even walked away from the faith because of poor leadership, or at least become stagnant in their walk with God. But see, not only Christians are affected by poor church leaders. See, the outside of the church is looking in. They're watching. And poor church leadership can cause the church to fall short of what God has called them to do, and that's to share the gospel with the lost world. So looking at what God has to say about church leaders shouldn't be skipped over. It should be, we should study it, especially in our day and age. When the outside world is trying to to set their own opinions and their own ideas of political correctness and how the church leaders should look and how they should act. So now if you haven't already done it, I want you to open up your Bibles. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy 3 and we're gonna get started. I'm gonna read the first seven verses in 1 Timothy 3. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation by the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace or into the snare of the devil. You know, as a young child, I grew up in a, a little tiny church, going to church every single Sunday, and it was, it was a Lutheran church called Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Not only was it Lutheran, it was German Lutheran. And... I attended it for years. We never missed a Sunday, ever. And I can tell you, I learned so much sitting in the pews of that church. That's where I first heard about Jesus. And I learned that he loved me so much that he wanted to die for me. I learned that not only that, that he rose from the dead, and then I rose, I learned that he is coming back someday. And he's gonna take me back with him. It's a message I was fascinated with back then and I still am today. But if any of you know this about the German Lutheran Church, you know that it's a very, very structured service. It's very strict, very structured through the whole thing. In fact, in my early years, this changed later on, but in the early years, the women sat on one side and the, women on, or the men on the other and the children were in the front three rows, the older children, and it'd be boys and girls. We were separated. That changed later on, but in the German Lutheran Church, at an early age, you're expected to participate with the service. We didn't have cry rooms. Everybody was in the church. And if you weren't gonna participate, you were expected to sit very still and very quiet while everyone else participated. Now during the early years of my life, say before I was maybe four or five, I would have been sitting with one of my parents in the back of the church. That's where they kind of kept the younger children so we wouldn't disturb everybody else. And that's exactly where I would have been found because as many of you know, for me, sitting still is not my spiritual gift. (laughs) And it wasn't back then. See, my daddy used to say, and he just told me this the other day, honey, you only have two speeds. You have full throttle and sound asleep. (laughs) And that's exactly how I was back then. So on any given Sunday, I would be in the back of the church. Usually I was in my daddy's lap because my mother was completely sick and tired of my nonsense by then. And so I'd be sitting in my daddy's lap and I would sit there and he would start to sing the hymns, sing these beautiful hymns to God and he would have his big arthritic hands out in front of me and my hands would be in his and I would play that organ in his fingers through the whole time. And I'm just telling you, there were times I was one chord short of taking Miss Lois's organist job. I was that good. She still plays in that church on certain occasions, and I've gotten to hear her play. But when that music stopped and Reverend Peter started preaching, he would get up there, and my dad knew he was going to have to do something to keep me still. So he would start this old thing called, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and see all the people. And we would do it over and over and over again. And the number of times that we would do it would be directly proportionate to how long that sermon went. 
because I would do it over, I would do it with his hands, I would do it with my hands. And thinking back on that simple little rhyme, church rhyme, I think it held a bit of wisdom, a bit of spiritual wisdom. See, the church that Paul is speaking about here, it's not the universal church, he's talking about the local church. He's talking about that church where believers gather within a community to worship together. It's that place where God's truths are gonna be taught, believers are gonna be equipped, and then they're gonna be encouraged to go out and share it with the rest of the world. And Paul in his letter to Timothy is gonna identify two primary leadership roles. He says they're the elders and they're the deacons. Now I read something that described the elders as servant leaders. So in my little church rhyme, I kind of see the elders as this part of it. They're like the walls and the foundation because they're making these decisions that are foundational to the operation of the church. And they stand guard around the doctrine that the church is protecting. They're protecting it so that it's not subject to change with the changing opinions in the world and the political correctness. They're standing on what God's word is saying. Now we know, because we've heard this before, that the Bible is breathed out by God. And you know, what that means is that men wrote it, of course, but what they wrote was revealed to them by God. So by that, we can conclude that church leadership was designed by God. It was not designed by men, and we have to be very careful not to impose our own human ideas of leadership roles and structures on God's design, because his is gonna be perfect. He designed the church leadership to be a display of his glory not man's glory. But he didn't only design it to be a display of his glory, he designed it to be completely dependent on the gospel, on the gospel of Christ. See, the character, the roles, and the responsibility of the church leadership is only possible as a result of Christ living in his people. And that strength that they need to lead the church in God's will comes from Jesus Christ. That's how they do it. So the first group that Paul addresses in this letter to Timothy is the church elders. Now some translations may group pastors into this group, leader, a group of leaders, but in any of their translation, these are the ones who oversee the work and the ministry and the teaching of the local church. So to become an elder is a decision that's not to be taken lightly. It's supposed to be very serious. It was in the early church and it is still today. You know, I also want to mention that I noticed that in the New Testament, the word elder is almost always occurring in the plural form. So that tells me that in the New Testament scriptures, that church, the local church, it's not a dictatorship. It's a group of leaders leading the church. Now, although Paul lays out qualifications for an elder in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, he doesn't tell us the responsibilities so much of the elder other than the fact that they're to be overseers of the local church. But Paul does this. He addresses in Acts 20. Look at your verse sheet. It's 28 through 31. Paul is speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus, and he says this. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own cells will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish everyone with tears. See, Paul gives the elders four different responsibilities. He says they're gonna lead under the authority of Christ, they're gonna care for the body of Christ, and they're gonna see that God's word is taught accurately. And lastly, they're supposed to model the character of Christ. And then in 1 Timothy 3, one through seven, we jump forward. Paul goes that step further and he's gonna tell us the qualifications that help them model the character of Christ. On that list, there's be above reproach. See, being above, living a life that is above reproach means that you're living in such a way that nothing legitimately can be, be said of you to rebuke you that's gonna stick. Because, because the way you're living, you have such a credible reputation that eventually you're, the way you live is gonna quit you because it's gonna pr prove that you're blameless. You're living a life where your reputation is credible. You're not teaching one thing or leading one way and then living another. 
It says that to be the husband of one wife. Now some churches, this is translated all over the place. I'm gonna give you how our church translates this. And that says that it, it says that a man cannot be divorced and remarried. He must be a one woman man, it's kinda like the song says. Now it doesn't apply to a man who's widowed and remarried, only to one that's been divorced and remarried. Now listen here, there are many places in the church that we can, that, that we can serve that we're qualified to serve. There's just two places. It's the elders and the deacons. He has these qualifications there. If you have ever been affected by this, or if you ever are affected by this somehow in your life, just remember this, that, that it's best to focus on all those other things you can do. There are so many places in the church that you are qualified to serve. Find something and do it with excellence. See, if there's one thing I've learned by studying the Bible, it's this. If God put it in there, it's in there for a reason. I may not fully understand it. It may not be very comfortable for me at times, but I know this. I know he loves me. I know he wants my very best. He has my interest at heart. And I can trust him with that. He said, I don't have to always know all the words. That's what my, my son, who just turned 20 last week, Casey used to say when he was a little toe-headed guy. He would run through the house. He was very inquisitive, and I was so worn out by him by the end of the day. And often I would just give him a quick one or two word answer. Yes, no, whatever. And he would grab me by the pant leg and pull me down, and he'd get my hands in his little chubby, my face in his little chubby hands, and he'd go, Mommy, tell me all the words. And you know what, sometimes I did tell him all the words, but sometimes I didn't. Sometimes I would just grab his little chubby face and i say, because I'm mommy, I know best, and I said so. <laughs> See, God always loves me and he knows what's best for me, so I can rest on that when something doesn't seem easy or it's kind of difficult for me to understand in his word. Moving on, he says, you're supposed to be sober-minded. The elder is to be serious and earnest about his job as an elder. He's supposed to have an attitude that places a very high value on the gospel of Christ. He's supposed to be self-controlled and respectable. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. He's supposed to be hospitable. Literally translated, that means they're supposed to love the stranger. That's what it meant. You know, in the early church, hospitality was a big deal. Because when Christians were traveling to different towns, they didn't have the local Holiday Inn or Ramada or Hyatt, whatever you choose to stay when you travel. They needed safe, secure places to stay. So today, it just means the same thing it means there, in that day, it means to make someone feel comfortable and give them an atmosphere where they feel loved and accepted. It says that they're supposed to be able to teach. The speak, this, says, this speaks to the elder's ability to understand the scriptures. He should be able to communicate those truths to others. Now, this does not mean he needs to be a public speaker. Not everybody can do that. He may very well teach publicly, but he also may teach more privately, just one-on-one. -on -one. But all elders should possess an understanding of the scriptures. They're not to be a drunkard, it says. Now, there's this huge difference between the cultural use of wine in the, in the biblical times and the overuse of alcohol in today's society. See, in biblical times, a lot of times, the water wasn't pure enough to even drink, so they'd have to drink wine. Sometimes they mixed it but they still weren't supposed to drink until they were drunk. And as an elder, it says that they would be good to set an example because, because there may be believers and unbelievers that are struggling with addictions of alcohol, and they should always be aware of that and try to set a good example. It says not to be greedy, not violent. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Not quarrelsome. It's not, they're not supposed to relish fighting or being, arguing with others. It doesn't say they, can't comp, they have to compromise on their convictions. It just says that they should, be able to dis, they should disagree without being disagreeable. Be willing to talk things out. They're not to be lovers of money. It doesn't say they're not supposed to have money. It just said they're not supposed to be lovers of money. It's not supposed to be their main focus. They're supposed to manage your own family well. You know, for the Christian, the church, and the home are kind of the same. They should both be overseen with love, truth, and discipline. Church leaders can't act one way and then act a different way in their own home as they lead their family. They're not to be a recent convert. This church leader should not be a new Christian. And it's simple to say, it's easy to say that age is no, no guarantee for spiritual maturity. 
but you should have had some time studying the scriptures, knowing God's scriptures, before you start leading others, and you've grown in your faith. They should be well thought of by outsiders. The church leaders are representatives of Christ to not only us, but the outside of the, world, outside of the church. They should live a life that leads to having a good reputation, both inside the church and outside the church. Let's continue by reading 1 Timothy 3. I'm gonna read the next uh, five verses, eight through 13. And this one's gonna talk about deacons. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> These verses are describing the qualities of the deacon in the church. The word deacon is literally translated as servant, humble servant. I would kind of call them in my little church rhyme, they'd kind of be the steeples. Because you know, steeples are designed to draw our eyes upward, upward to God, and so we would be focused on God. See, the deacons are servants who are leading us to serve. They take on a practical task of serving the church so that the elders can stay focused on leading and teaching the church and protecting the doctrine. And they help us, they do the practical things so we can keep our eyes focused on serving God. Remember I mentioned that the elders were servant leaders? I'd like to describe the deacons as leading servants. They lead the servants. They're not the only ones that would be serving the church. They're making it possible so all of us can serve in the church. And Paul lists several qualifications for the deacon. They include this, say he should be dignified. <clears throat> I mean, that's just pretty self-explanatory, deserving of respect. Not double-tongued, he's not a gossip. He doesn't say one thing to one person and another to someone, something to someone else. His, he can be taken at his word. He's not addicted to much wine, which we've already discussed. He's not greedy, we discussed. He holds the mysteries of the faith with a clear conscience. See, that means that the deacon should understand the doctrine in the Bible and he'll be able to obey it with a clear conscience. And once they do that, they base their decisions on the word of God and then they back up everything they do by a godly life. They should know the Bible better than the church constitution. Because see, in the early church, the Bible was the church constitution. And it says you should be tested and proven. See, an untested Christian is an unprepared Christian. I don't know about you, but I kind of sometimes feel like I'm well prepared. Because don't you feel like you're constantly being tested? And what is he getting us ready for, for crying out loud? But see, this isn't a new concept at all. In fact, quite a few leaders in the Bible were tested first before they became, as servants before they became leaders. If you look at Joseph, he was a servant in Egypt for 13 years before he became second in command. You look at Moses, he cared for sheep for 40 years before God called him to do his work. Joshua was Moses' was his servant and then later became Moses' successor. And then if you look at David, he was tending sheep when Samuel came out and anointed him to be the king of Israel. You see this pattern? It's a pattern of first a servant and then a leader. It made sense back then and it makes sense today. And then it says their wives should be worthy of respect. That's simply saying what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I mean, if he's gotta do it, we should too. Godliness starts at home, we need to be doing the same thing we're told to do here and how to behave. And then and last, it says a husband and one wife. I don't think we need to beat that one again. We've been over it. And have a well-managed home. That was explained earlier. So by worldly standards, the position of deacon may seem kind of menial, maybe kind of undesirable at times, but by God's standards, it's an important and honorable position. And Paul says that it leads to two different things. He said that it leads to an excellent standing among fellow Christians, and it leads to great confidence in their own faith in Jesus Christ. 
See, by humbly serving at a job that lacks the rewards that are important by worldly standards, the deacon is tested of his, of his own true motives. Is he, are his motives to serve coming from a Christ-like spirit of selflessness, or is it by, are they motivated by, something, motivated by something else? It's the same thing we should be asking ourselves. Ladies, this is a big, long list. I mean, it's a tall order for church leaders. And trust me when I say this, that Satan loves nothing more than to disgrace God's people by causing church leaders to stumble into sin. And they wanted to, he wants to do it all the while the world is watching on. It brings him great delight. See, as Christians, we need to pray for our church leaders so they're able to do what God has called them to do, that they're able to maintain this good reputation both inside and outside the church. That is how we can serve our church leaders. Constantly be in prayer for them. Continue on. We're gonna read the last few verses, and we'll finish up here. It's about the mystery of godliness in 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is a mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. So here we are. We have our church. We have our steeple, and now we're gonna open the doors. Here we are. It's talking about all of us, all the people. We've come to that part in 1 Timothy 3 that, that hopefully if you didn't, if you skipped over it before you read it this time, because it applies to us. This part, these three little verses have more doctrine packed in them than so much of the Bible. And it's in there because he wants us to know how to behave in church. Now, I want you to go back with me to that little church in Kansas and flash forward a few years, and I'm gonna give an example how not to behave in church, okay? <laughs> I have a few of them. <clears throat> I was probably eight or nine, and my best friend Angie and I were sitting in the front row of the church for a good reason, because see, Angie and I both had the same problem. We couldn't sit still, and once we started giggling, we couldn't stop. Now, I saw her about five years ago, and we ate dinner together, and it was the same. It hasn't changed. We giggled for two and a half solid hours. And on this particular day, it was no different. We were in the front row, and Angie and I were both wearing those really long knee socks that have kind of come back. And I've, mine were probably red, because they were my favorite. And in the middle of Reverend Peter's sermon, we started to roll our socks down until they got down around our ankles, and it was this huge tube of socks going around our ankles, and we looked like something out of the Jetsons cartoon. And for some reason, that struck us as the funniest thing we'd ever seen. And we started giggling, and not just giggling, but I'm talking that giggling with a pew, everybody in the pew is kind of shaking, and there are tears, and you kind of have your head down, and all of a sudden, we hear this stop in the sermon, and Reverend Peter, who happened to be Angie's grandfather, looked down <laughs> and said, Angie and Vanita, is there something you'd like to share with the rest of the congregation? <laughs> oh my gosh, you could have heard a pin drop. We were horrified, we were horrified, not because, just because the whole congregation was staring at us, but remember, this was in the 70s. We knew when we left that church, our daddies were gonna wear our bottoms out with a paddle. We weren't gonna be able to sit down for days, we were gonna be in so much pain. That is how you don't act in church. <laughs> See, Angie and I weren't taking serious the gospel that Reverend Peter was preaching from the pulpit. We were not exhibiting godly behavior in the house of God. It's that place where Paul calls a church, it's a church of the living God. It's a pillar, it's a buttress of truth. Paul calls a church the household of God because see, God's church is a family. And when you're a sinner, when you're a sinner and you believe on Jesus Christ as your savior, that person immediately becomes part of God's family. And Paul is advising Timothy to treat the members of the local church as he would treat other mem the members of his own family. 
He says they're gonna have to be fed and nourished. They're gonna have to be disciplined. They're gonna need to be given an example to follow and they need to be encouraged. Paul also describes the church as a pillar and buttress of truth. You know, this architectural image would have been a great deal to Timothy because he lived in Ephesus. There was architectural design all around him. In fact, the goddess Diana, that temple had 127 different pillars. And often, many of the statues were up like this. They'd be really tall and, and on a pillar. And the statues you'd put up there so that everyone around could see them. See, the local church is to hold up the word of God so all the world can see it. Essentially, it's saying the local church is to put Jesus Christ on display in the lives of their faithful members so the world will be changed by it. Lastly, Paul describes a church as a buttress of truth. Now, some of your translations may have used the word bulwark, but these words are slightly different definition, but they kind of are both clear illustrations of the church. See, the buttress, if they'll put it up, is... Um, is that part that sticks out, the stone or the brick part, and it's to help hold the wall upright. It keeps it upright. And then a bulwark would have been this, like this wall going all around this fortress. And it's built around a structure for protection from outside enemies, from outside forces. So in a sense, both the buttress and the bulwark are for support and defense. So that what Paul is saying here is that the church is to uphold or support God's truths and defend those truths from attacks by false, false doctrines and false people, false teachers, and outside forces that are trying to change it. It's a gathering place of pure and godly people supporting and defending God's pure doctrine. So when he says that it's a pillar and buttress of truth, he's essentially saying we're called as a church to protect, preserve, and proclaim God's word. They're, hold firm, they're to hold firm and hold high God's word, not man's opinion and not man's wisdom. Okay, now you remember what I told you about Angie and I. That's how not to act in church. Paul is gonna go on, he's gonna tell you how to act in church and, and why we're to act that way. You know, in some nations, the leaders have someone on staff known as a chief of protocol, and the chief of protocol is going to come into that leader and, and describe, if before a dignitary arrives, and he's going to tell them, you know, you, you don't bow, you shake their hand, you don't shake their hand. What, you do whatever is cultural, not offensive to them, and what's acceptable for them, okay? So for us, the Bible, as Christians, the Bible is our chief of protocol. And everything we need to know about how to act and how to be godly is right here in God's word. So Paul tells us first, he says, as Christians, as Christ followers, we're to display godliness. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this is much easier said than done. But then in the same sentence, he gets, it makes it a little more confusing. He says, it's not, it's, this mist, it's not just a mystery, it's the great mystery. Godly is, godliness is the great mystery. You know, it's easy to confuse Godliness with just living a good life. It's, it's so confused everywhere. But there's a huge difference between godliness and what I like to call goodliness. Now I get it, there's some English nerds out there. Don't come up here and school me afterwards that goodliness is not a word, I get that. But it's about the only way I could describe this thing called godliness. Godliness, or goodliness as I like to call it, simply put is us, trying to be good, follow the rules, and it's on our own accord, and it's on our own strength. And I'm telling you, it's self-focused, it's based on our works and our efforts, and eventually it's gonna fail. You're gonna fail, and you're gonna be, sh you're gonna be empty and lost. Now, godliness, it's not just being good. See, it's a totally different thing. It's everything you do, everything you think, God permeates it. It means your words, your actions, your, your mind, everything is centered around God and it's based on the work of Christ, not on your works. And it's not focused on us, but rather it's focused on Christ and displaying him through us. So why does Paul call it the mystery of godliness? Well, first of all, it's the kind of mystery he's talking about is not the kind that something, a mystery that's unsolved or difficult to find like Columbo or Murder, She Wrote or something like that. What he's talking about is something that was hidden for a time and now it's been revealed. 
See, as soon as Paul mentions this great mystery, he jumps right in to what was most likely him of the first century church, and they would have used it probably in their public worship, so it might have been kind of familiar to these people. And what he's saying is that the mystery of godliness is revealed by Christ. That is a mystery of godliness. Paul gives us six separate truths to support this. He said he was manifested in the flesh. To put that in easier terms, he's just saying that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ came to live among us, live with us, look like us, and God and all his godliness were revealed to us through Jesus Christ. Secondly, it says he's vindicated by the Spirit. Now, some translations may have said verified. Either way, Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit affirmed that Christ is the Son of God. Look at Matthew 3, 16, or Matthew 3, 16 and 17 on your verse sheet. It says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased. And then 8, 11, uh, Romans 8, 11 says, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. See, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus when he was baptized by John, in the, in, when he was baptized by John, and that Spirit was there to verify that this was God's Son. But ultimately, Christ was vindicated by the Spirit when the Spirit raised him from the dead. And then it says he was seen by the angels. See, some translations might say he was praised among the heavens. Paul is saying that Christ was seen and adored by the angels. See, they sang at his birth. They announced his birth. They announced his resurrection. They witnessed his ascension. They testified to the glory of Christ. And he is proclaimed among the nations, it says, beginning with the early disciples and continuing all the way up to present day, Jesus is being proclaimed among the nations. I know that sometimes it's hard to believe, as we said here in our little Bible bubble, <clears throat> and you watch the news and you look around and you think, there can't be Jesus anywhere else in this world. But he is. If you don't believe me, do this one simple thing. Before you leave on a trip, do what my husband and I started doing about maybe 15, 20 years ago. We pray that God will show us where he's working and sometimes let us step in. And every time we travel, doesn't matter where we go, we always get to see and witness God working. It has been so much fun. One in particular was just an a, a, a interaction between two women. One was a Jewish woman and a, her friend, and she was sharing her testimony. And we were in the middle of nowhere in Manhattan, and we got to overhear it, and we got to, a chance to pray for that woman. I mean, it's just everywhere you go, you will see God. It just opens your eyes to everything he's doing all around you. And then it says he believed on in the world. He's believed on in the world. You know, some translations may say something like he is a savior of the world. In Acts, we're all commissioned to take the gospel of Christ to the end of the earth. That was happening way back in Paul's time, and it's still happening today. From Asia to Africa to America to Europe, people are hearing the gospel, they're believing the gospel, and they're experiencing salvation from the penalty of their sins. And lastly, it said he was taken up in glory. He is the king of kings. And when he ascended, he ascended up to sit at the right hand of his father where he is interceding for us every single day. See, by telling us these truths in, Paul, in verse 16, Paul is not just proclaiming that Christ is godliness. He's also saying to the church, he's saying, think about what this means for godliness in the church and in your lives. He's saying the great mystery is this, it's Christ. It's Christ in you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God incarnate, the one who was verified and vindicated by the Spirit. He was raised from the dead. He was praised among the angels. He's been proclaimed across the earth. He's been believed on as a Savior, and he's been crowned King of Kings. If you've placed your trust in him, he lives in you. Let that sink in for a second. See, the Son of God resides in you, and he is the one who gives you the power, the strength, and the grace to live a godly life. So godliness is simply put the overflow of Christ in you. Look at Colossians 1, 25 through 29 in your verse sheet. 
Paul is writing and he says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Behold the mystery of godliness. It's very different than goodliness. It has nothing to do with our works and our efforts. And in this confession of the mystery of godliness, Paul is asking and urging the churches to pay attention to the importance and the calling of the church. See, being founded by Christ and built on Christ, the church is to be a preview of his kingdom. And this occurs when his people love and serve at an overflow of Christ in them. Our lives are not independent performances but rather they're a revelation of our inner spirit which is united with Christ. Our relationship with God will be demonstrated through the way we live and the choices we make. What is in our heart will eventually show up on our outward behavior. Look at Matthew 23 on your verse sheet. It says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but on the inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. <clears throat> What's on the inside will eventually show up on the outside. You know, my golf buddies and I have a saying that usually occurs about hole number 16. You know, we've played several holes by now. We're kind of tired. We're usually very hungry. <clears throat> the game is getting more frustrating and the wheels are starting to fall off, at least for me. And someone never fails to get up on the tee box and they always say, oh my goodness, my tired is hanging out. It's usually me. Ladies, is your godliness hanging out? See, I'm not talking about your goodliness. See, with Christ as a king of your heart, your godliness should always be hanging out. Please pray with me. Precious Father, we love your words. We love the nuggets of truth that you share with us. Father, we want to be godly women. We want to honor you with our lives. Lord, show us how to do that. Teach us. Keep us in your will. And Father, as we go from here, I pray that we would be a light to those around of you and your gospel. In Christ's name I pray this. Amen.